skip through this part. We've all seen this a billion times, right? Thanks so much for joining. Um, my name is Evan. I'm an American. I'm currently living in Paris, but I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy that so many people showed up. Um, I was going to talk for about 30 minutes about my work, and then we can have some snacks and have some drinks. That sound about right? Um, so the name of the show is Flight Mode. Um, and the pieces that you're seeing in here were all made either on an airplane or in an airport. Um, not all my work happens in these venues. I have, I have one section of work that happens primarily in public spaces. Um, so that it's oftentimes making tools for graffiti writers or making, uh, yeah, pieces like this. This is a series called Propulsion Paintings. It's a series of very simple spray paint modifications. I have another series of work that happens in more traditional art spaces with white walls like here or like here. Uh, and I have a third portion of my work that happens on the internet, um, work that is inspired by and meant to be natively viewed within a browser. Uh, this is from a new series called Tribute to Heather, which is um, compositions made from found animated GIFs. And so these are very uh, different practices, right? Different mediums, different venues. But the connection that I see between the pieces is this idea of the hack, or these philosophies that come from hacker communities, which I'll talk about a bit more in, in a minute. But that's really the other theme to this show. Like, despite um, the obvious of it all being uh, rendered within an airport, this idea of the hack is also something that maybe connects these pieces in a more meaningful way, perhaps, than just where they were made. So hopefully that'll be clear at the end of this. So, there's a lot of different definitions for the word hacker. It's changed over time. Um, the first definition of the, of the word hacker actually started at MIT, uh, having not to do with computers, but MIT's Tech Model Railroad Club back in 1959. Part of that first definition was an article or project without constructive end, right? So it's fitting that like this first definition of the word hack had nothing to do with computers, right? Uh, and so I, I see this when I look at a lot of street art. This is a project by one of my favorite street artists named Brad Downey. Another person who is, of course, a big figurehead in defining what hacker culture is, what open source culture is. These two communities, are, they overlap so much it's hard to talk about one without the other. But this is Linus Torvald, the creator of Linux, which I'm sure many people are familiar with. Um, and, and Linus has, he talks a lot about fun when he's talking about motivations and, and reasons that the open source community functions. Um, he has, so he has this quote, I've always seen open source as a way of making the world a better place. But more than that, I see it as a way of having fun, right? And so this idea of fun, uh, I think especially for artists that are interested in activist or social driven projects is, it's something that it's important. It's in, and at least in the work that I'm inspired by, the work that I try to make, fun is often uh, something that makes the politics go down easier, right? I think uh, other people in here might agree with me on that. Um, and so this, this notion of playful cleverness was a term that kept coming up when I was doing research on these different definitions of what hacking is. Um, and so, so this photo is actually taken, were any of the workshop participants, are they in the room? Can I see hands from people that were here? So this was a couple days ago, thank you. Um, I handed out these available online for free stickers, which there might still be some outside if anybody wants any. Uh, and then we all just went our own ways. Some of us went to the mall, some of us went to bookshops, some of us went to software stores, some of us went to porno shops, um, and found these items, found these data. It's, it's a little bit of 
It's playful cleverness of the obvious, of course, right? Stating the obvious that this data is all freely available to us. Um, and so there's, these are all photos uh, of, of people that were participating in this project just a couple of days ago. So these are all fresh stickers to the city. There's a loop of these up in the lobby here if you want to see the whole, the whole, uh, whole group of them. <laughs> There's a, I'm going to talk a little bit about Eric S. Raymond, who wrote a series of publications uh, in the late 90s surrounding open source culture. He's also a programmer, uh, hacker. Um, and part of his How to Become a Hacker manifesto, he says, Work as intensely as you play, and play as intensely as you work. For true hackers, the boundaries between play and work, science and art, all tend to disappear or merge into a high-level creative playfulness. And so this idea of play is something that I, I, I enjoy making. I enjoy consuming artwork that involves play. Um, this is from a completely different series of work that I've been doing called Multi-Touch Paintings. This piece is called Angry Birds uh, Level 1-1. So if, for anybody who's like an avid Angry Birds fan, this is something else I actually do on airports quite a bit, is uh, play these horrible video games that we all have in our pockets now. Um, so, so the way this print was created was I put a piece of tracing paper over my mobile phone uh, and played Angry Birds uh, with inked fingers, right? Because you can see the screen through the tracing paper, and it leaves these sort of these gestures that we're all sort of getting trained to do by uh, these computers that never leave us. This is another one from the series called Slide to Unlock, right? This gesture that up until a few years ago we didn't, humankind had no reason to do this, right? This is user interface training us to do this new movement, like there was no reason, you know, and now we do this like 20 times a day. And so the piece is meant to be about kind of archiving, it's meant to be about identity, it's meant to be about us going through this first sort of awkward few years where we all are touching our pixels for the first time. This is a username and password uh, on the keyboard to an active account. Uh, more recently, I did a series where I played Angry Birds from start to finish. It took me, th took me three eight-hour chunks over the course of three days um, and recorded every, every gesture that it took. These are all the winning levels from that. There's actually many, many more. Uh, stacks and stacks of paper, every gesture that it took to complete the project. Um, th this is what the installation looks like. It was something like six, 1,600 um, between the attempted levels and the solved levels. And so, so in addition to kind of archiving these like awkward gestures, it's also meant to be a visualization of time, right? Of like this idea of passive computing that we're all sort of experimenting with, right? That we don't have to just be seated at desks anymore, that these computers we can do on our commutes, we can do it on the subway, and, and all these little moments, they, they, they add up, right? For better, for worse. Wikipedia has a definition of the word hacker, of course, um, part of which says to expose or add functionality to a device that was unintended for use by the end users, by the company who created it. And this is where I feel like graffiti sort of, for me anyway, comes into play with the hacker community. Um, and I've been fascinated with graffiti for a long time, and more recently I've been coming to the realization that the reason I've been so fascinated with graffiti is really because I'm fascinated with hackers, right? And I think that graffiti writers just happen to be some of the most interesting hackers. Um, so when I'm looking at graffiti and I'm inspired by graffiti, it's much more about how that graffiti is hacking into existing systems, right? Much more about like where it's placed and why versus how beautiful the color scheme, right? So when I look at, this is a famous photo by Martha Cooper in New York, um, documenting kind of that early heyday of graffiti and how it grew up with the subway system, right? And so when I'm, when I'm thinking back to that, it's not how beautiful the car is, it's not the cam control, it's not the line quality, it's the system that they were hacking, right? Like hacking into the subway, it's something I think is so associated with graffiti that we tend to not even think about it anymore. But this was a really clever hack, right? There was an existing infrastructure that had a totally different use and a group of young people found an exploitation. They found a weakness in that system that these trains were unguarded, at least at the time. And they could use it to do something besides transport people and instead they used it to transport art, right? And so it's this idea of of, of the, the system hacking, this idea of unintended use that I'm so interested in. And so when I engage with the graffiti community, it's more, it's more about thinking about these hacks on an urban scale than it is about 
anything to do with ink or anything to do necessarily with spray paint. This is a, a piece called Laser Tag um, that was a part of a, a group I co-founded called Graffiti Research Lab. Um, th this piece was made with a collaborator James Powderly and Theo Watson. So this idea of unintended use, right? Like the, the Krylon company had no idea that people were gonna take their product and point it at someone else's property. This is something else I think, like when we, the graffiti is so part of our pop culture now that we don't really think about, but that was a really big moment someone had when instead of painting their kind of lawn furniture, they went to the neighbor's house, right? It's like a very big mental shift that completely transforms this object into something totally different. And so that idea of unintended use, I think, is, is really like a lens that we can look at, not only technology, but like everything, right? The unintended use can take something like a robotic vacuum cleaner, which is an inherently boring technology, and just by sort of <coughs> duct taping knives to it, right, all of a sudden this boring technology becomes kind of fascinating uh, and playful. And so this idea, this is from an internet meme. I, I wish this is one of my pieces, but this is from an internet meme that was going around for a while called Doomba. So this idea of creative disrespect, right? This idea that we stop sort of holding our technology on a pedestal and treating it as so precious that we can't start um, treating it in ways that are less precious. So this is, this is Eric S. Raymond, who I was talking about a bit earlier. Probably one of the more, probably the, one of the most important characters for talking about and defining and writing about hacker culture, especially as it grew up with Linux and with open source. He wrote a really uh, often cited book called The Cathedral and the Bazaar, um, which can be downloaded on his website for free. Um, and in it, he's using these two metaphors to talk about two different design approaches, right? And one being the cathedral, which is like a single architect, a sort of top-down approach towards making something. Uh, and the other is the marketplace that happens out in front, which might not necessarily have a singular plan, right? It's created because these different vendors come together each might have their own uh, ideas of what a successful shop looks like. Um, each might have their own sort of goals for what they're selling, but nonetheless they come together and they create a piece of infrastructure that functions very differently than the cathedral, but is perhaps equally important within the city. And Raymond goes on to talk about, he's, he's really talking a lot about Linus Torvald, and he says that Linus's genius had nothing to do with writing code, but that it had to do with seeing the quickest way between two points, right? And he, he has this quote where he, he claims that his genius was being lazy like the fox. Um, and this is where I'm always trying to get back to in my work. Like any time I find myself spending more than a few hours on something, I'm always, I'm constantly thinking like, could I be working smarter, right? Could I be working smarter instead of harder? Um, and a lot of the pieces that are in this exhibition come from channeling this kind of lazy like a fox mentality. Um, the piece that you're sitting on here is uh, artifact perhaps from this performance piece which is called How to Keep Motherfuckers from Putting Their Seats Back. Um, it involves a very simple technology which I love is a, is a zip tie. So on the back of the seat, it's a very subtle installation but you can see two zip ties uh, which when placed around the tray table armature can keep the seats from moving back. Um, but it also sets up this weird kind of game dynamic too where if the people in front figure out what's going on They could work together, right? Like if they both go back at the same time, then they can both go back um, So this is kind of Trying to channel the lazy like a fox right trying to have the least amount of work for the biggest possible impact and this idea of ease of implementation is really big within uh, within hacker culture, you get more credit for solving a line, for a problem in a, in a smaller number of lines of code. Um, and this idea of release early and often was a kind of open source dictum related to publication and to stemming innovation that's been around for a long time now. Um, I started a, uh, I co-founded a um, collaborative group based on this release early and often sort of theory as applied to a collaborative art practice. Uh, we're called the Free Art and Technology Lab. And essentially it's, it's a, a group of friends that have met doing various different art exhibitions that have interests uh, that are very wide, but most of us have core interests in free speech and free culture issues. Um, we exist entirely on the internet. We are primarily an email list. Like we, you know, we get kind of billed as being a sort of technology geared group, but really it all centers around a very old technology, which is just a simple email list. Um, and we collaborate on blogs, we collaborate on IRC. 
we have no money and we don't ask for any money. Um, there's no, the only rule within the group is that anybody can have passwords to anything they want. Um, there's no hierarchy within the group. Uh, James Powderly and myself kind of co-founded it, but quickly gave up as much as we could to the members that we asked to join us. Everybody has admin privileges to everything. And so it's kind of this sort of um, respectful anarchy, this sort of group based on collaboration through um, trusted anarchy amongst friends. Um, and it, this, we don't have any kind of stated dictum or stated purpose necessarily, but I think it comes, this, this idea of playfulness, this idea of fun is related to what we're doing because one thing we're trying to do is get this, this fear of open source culture and a free culture to kind of encroach more into general popular culture. So we're interested in making pop media. We're interested in having things that people might click on irregardless of the politics. They might click on it just to be entertained. Um, and, and so we kind of have this like Tootsie Pop theory about work, which is that there's candy on the outside, but hopefully there's like a chocolate nugget in the middle, right? Hopefully that it's not just lol cat videos, but that there's something else that we're usually seeding within that content. Uh, if anybody was here for the last exhibition for Aram's show, is anybody here for that one? So Aram's a good friend of mine. He's one of the Fat Lab members. Um, he probably maybe showed this video, so I won't show all of it. But this was a collaborative Fat Lab project that involved, um, again, it's a very simple hack. Well, most of the best ones are. So we rented a car, which you know you can do for relatively cheap. Um, Aram ordered the, this roof rack off of eBay for like 15 euros. And then we constructed this fake camera out of cardboard. There's absolutely no technology above the roof of this car. It's just uh, cardboard and duct tape that's meant to look like the Google car, right? And so this is a, a social hack, right? <laughs> so this is drinking and driving. We were doing these sort of little skits and then releasing them on the internet as if we, we bugged the Google car and we're tracking it throughout Berlin. I don't even think they have carjackings like in anywhere but the US probably, but there's a lot of Americans in the group. <laughs> so this is all online, but this is sort of an example of um, this kind of work, right? Like we're trying, the end goal is that we're trying to get these ideas outside of just the tech blogs that might already cover issues related to data monopolies, issues related to how Google is encroaching. <laughs> you have to have the fail video, right? Um, and so we'll make this kind of, pop project and then try to seed it with these messages, right? Get people questioning like, okay, why would these, what, what, I thought Google was not evil, you know? How come, why would these people be doing this? And then trying to get uh, people beyond sort of tech crunch talking about these things, right? Trying to get it more in uh, so something that you might pick up in the newspaper and read over coffee, like trying to get these ideas into this wider sphere. So that's Fat Lab. Um, I'll show just a few more projects. I'm going to go back to Eric S. Raymond for a minute. He has a, a really nice piece of sort of hacker lore, an article called How to Become a Hacker. Um, and he's been revising it over time, and it's still on his website in this kind of like really beautiful, like old hand coded HTML. Uh, and so he has these several points in here. Uh, and so he says the, the first step is that the world is full of fascinating problems waiting to be solved. Uh, you also have to develop a kind of faith in your own learning capacity, a belief that even though you may not know all of what you need to solve a problem, if you tackle just a piece of it and learn from that, you'll learn enough to solve the next piece and so on until you're done. Uh, and, and this is, I think part of what is interesting to me about hacking is this idea of empowerment, right? This idea that, uh, you know, like, like Linux, right? Like people could come together and with no profit motivation could build a piece of software that's powering the internet, right? Could, could make something that powerful based on, not on profit, but on sharing, right? This is like very, I don't know, motivating for me. Um, and this, this idea that you can kind of chip away at problems and solve things that are bigger than you is kind of what open source is based on. Uh, and one example from uh, my own practice, this is a project called iWriter. This is a collaborative project that involved um, primarily Fat Lab members, but also people from the Open Frameworks community, um, graffiti Research Lab. Uh, there was six, six of us in the beginning and the project has now grown to bigger than that. Uh, but it was, the main artist in the group is Tempt One, who's a graffiti writer in Los Angeles who nine years ago uh, developed Lou Gehrig's disease, which is otherwise known as ALS. And it's a degenerative disease that leaves you completely paralyzed. 
Um, you know, he, he has a machine to help him breathe, a machine to help him eat, and the only thing he has motion left in is his eyes, right? His mental capacity is 100% there, but he's trapped within this body that can only move with his eyes. And he was, uh, in the 90s, he was like a really, really influential activist and graffiti writer. He was part of a crew that was the first crew in Los Angeles that started um, using the freeway system. Like on the East Coast in the US, graffiti writers were using, they were hacking the subway system, right? And in, in Los Angeles, of course, it's a car-driven city. And so his crew was really hacking the freeway system. This was sort of a big moment in the development of graffiti in Los Angeles. And so, so the group of us sort of came together. None of us were professional developers. All of us had art school backgrounds. Um, and we worked together using open source tools to create the system that would let Temp draw graffiti again using his eyes. Uh, the document documentation you're seeing here was from a night where we had sort of two crews set up, like one in his hospital room and another projecting along the freeway so that he could write graffiti on this monitor and then look over to another web stream that was a live web stream and see the graffiti that he was writing projected up along the side of the highway. And so this is a, a very open project. Um, it's open source software running on um, consumer grade computers using the cheapest parts we could find, which was um, essentially a, a gaming camera, gaming webcam. Um, OK, I'm going to talk more about it in a second. But to go quickly back to Eric S. Raymond's How to Become a Hacker manifesto, uh, point two was no problem should ever have to be solved twice. To behave like a hacker, you have to believe that the thinking time of other hackers is precious, so much so that it's almost a moral duty for you to share information, solve problems, and then give the solutions away just so other hackers can solve new problems instead of having to perpetually readdress old ones, right? And this, of course, doesn't sound all that groundbreaking because this is just the academic model, right? This is what open source really is, is that you, you, you develop something, you give it away for free, people can start where you left off, and we all sort of come up together. Um, and so whenever I'm working digitally, everything I can, I give away for free in terms of source code. When I'm working with code um, in hardware, it usually takes the form of how-to guides. Um, the iWriter piece has both of those, but it's also an open data project. Um, the, the data that Temps writes with the system, it's saved in this file format that we're calling graffiti markup language, which is an open file format for storing gestural graffiti data, which is essentially XY time coordinates. And so what that means is that we had problems with this project in terms of developing an open source community around it because the, the software gets very complex very quickly, right? Like doing eye tracking is not a simple project, so it's hard for people who want to invest time in this piece to just jump in five hours on the weekend because it would take you five hours to read the code to get to the point where you'd be able to start helping. Uh, and so by opening up the data, what happened is that we were able to get a lot more collaboration because the data was so simple. Like, this file format's meant to be human readable. Like if you double click it and open it, you can see it's, very, it's structured very simply. There's a very simple header, there's a simple set of coordinates, and so it's very easy to pipe into things like processing, things like open frameworks, um, these, these visual programming languages that artists are getting more and more used to using. This is an example that um, Golan Levin, who's a Fat Lab member, who made the free art construction kit, if anyone's seen the 3D printed Lego block tool, this is Golan's project. He has a lab at Carnegie Mellon where he has these giant robots laying around. And within, within the matter of a few hours, he had a system working where he could take data that Tempt made with his eyes and pipe it into this robot that could then write tags. Um, and so it was, it was exciting for all of us to see, but it was really exciting for Tempt to see because Tempt was, could see this in the way that he had plotted the points with his eyes was really similar to the way he said his hand used to move when he was writing graffiti. And so for him to be able to watch this being drawn again was kind of a nice, a nice moment for the whole team. OK, number three is boredom and drudgery are evil. Hackers and creative people in general should never be bored or have to drudge at stupid, repetitive work. Because when this happens, it means they aren't doing what only they can do, solve new problems. This wastefulness hurts everybody. Therefore, boredom and drudgery are not just unpleasant, but actually evil. And I think that, more than anything, is why this exhibition came to be, right? A lot of these pieces were made from me being, on, being in airports, being in airplanes, being bored, being frustrated that I'm away from the studio, and then trying to make these places that are very controlled into places that I can then have to be my mobile studio. Um, the first piece in this series was 
the one on the backs of these three seats here. It's called Sky Mall Liberation. Uh, it was a project that was directly stemmed from boredom. In the US, we have these really amazing shopping catalogs on every flight called Sky Mall. Um, there's a lot of shopping catalogs in most flights around the world, but this one is like particularly nice. It's like a high grade shopping catalog, it, like steeped in ridiculousness. You know, like um, they, there's really awesome stuff in there, like uh, toilet paper dispensers with like an iPod dock, like stuff you really, really need, you know? Um, and, and so th this series started from taking that catalog and slowly like ripping out every face in the catalog, right? You, you can't have, there's non-sharp objects, right? You can't bring in scissors, so it's a very manual process. Um, and then using the tray table in front of me to then make these sort of demographic studies of that catalog. Um, so the ones that are on the back here, um, this one is, this is Apple products versus non-Apple products. So you can sort of see the direction technology is headed in. Anyone who bought Apple stock is like knows very well what this represents. Um, this one is white people versus non-white people. I've been doing this one, this white people versus non-white people over time. Uh, and there, a curator, actually Domenenko, pointed out that he, he found two of these photos I did with like three years in between of white people versus non-white people, and it only got worse, you know? I mean, I think in society things are getting better, but in Sky Mall, they're just, they're getting worse. Uh, and then this is touchscreen com computers versus non-touchscreen computers, right? So you can also kind of see the way things are headed. So this is Sky Mall Liberation, it's here. All right, the last point I'll talk about today from uh, Raymond's How to Become a Hacker Guide is freedom is good. Authoritarians thrive on censorship and secrecy, and they distrust voluntary cooperation and information sharing. They only like cooperation that they control. So to behave like a hacker, you have to develop an instinctive hostility to censorship, secrecy, and the use of force or deception to compel responsible adults, and you have to be willing to act on that belief. Like there's, there's this part of hacker culture that's naturally anti-authoritarian, and you see that. Um, you see that even in the sort of broad definition of hacking that applies to many, many things outside of computers. Um, so in terms of the freedom point, I'll, I'll talk about the piece that's on the back wall here, which is a, a series called TSA Communication, TSA being the Transportation Security Administration in the US, but of course we have uh, similar security systems in every city around the world. Um, like a lot of the other pieces, this is a very simple hack, and again, it's low tech. It's involving just stainless steel, so the way this works is I'll, I'll have an idea or a thought I want to communicate. I'll carve that into stainless steel. I'll put that in my carry-on bag. And as it goes through the x-ray device, it's a way of sort of, it's a very long process of getting an idea from my head into the heads of the security workers. And again, it's, it's meant to be fun, right? It's meant to sort of embody that sort of playful cleverness idea, hopefully. Um, it's, my ideal reactions from this piece are like laughter, right? Like if, if they sort of think this is funny, I'm much happier than if they think this is aggressive. Um, so this is the mind your own. You can see some of the plates are on the back wall here. And, and so for about a year and a half, this was my normal travel process. I would pick out one of these plates, uh, depending kind of on my mood, and I'd put it in my carry-on bag, and I would go about my business, right? And beyond being a kind of uh, hopefully humorous, uh, <laughs> humorous intervention. It's like one thing that it, just on a very, <laughs> this was in Bangkok. Like on a, on a personal level, like after doing this for a long time, the thing that I noticed is that it's just this, like these plates here, right, which visually are not so appealing, they're not even made that well. By just doing the simple action of putting it in my bag, my relationship with the airport was completely changed, right? I, instead of waking up and being tired and having like five cups of coffee and schlepping my bags to the airport and being sort of grumpy, instead I'm waking up and I'm nervous, uh, I'm alert, I'm, I'm trying to think of all the things that need to happen for me to pull this off, you know? It's not just walking through, of course, I'm always trying to think, okay, if there's a plan B, what should I do? How early should I get there? What if I don't show up and people, the curators get frustrated with me for not making it because I'm held back in security. How do I get the documentation, right? The documentation is actually the hardest part of this. Uh, and, and so all these things are going on in my head where had I not just put that piece of metal in my bag, none of those thoughts would have been going on. And that realization is what made me want to sort of keep making these pieces in airports, right? More so than uh, any statement about security or the theater of security. Um, 
for me, this was just kind of like an inspiring idea that I think um, maybe it's like more of a function of art in general than just hacking, which is like this ability to make something and have that something completely change your perceptions of your surroundings. Like these are, those are the kinds of pieces of art that make me want to make more <coughs> art. And so that's, that's really what all the work in here is trying to do. And even the work with graffiti is kind of similar. It's like less about the graffiti and more about allowing people a language to understand this writing that they see all around them in a way that where you can see the city in a new way. Um, so part of the video on the back wall is footage from my flight here, which was just four days ago, um, which I can play here, but it's now on both walls. Um, so you can see that if you want to keep watching. A lot of times this piece is actually, you can kind of see him take a double take and move away. But a lot of times it's just like this. Like it's not, it doesn't end up with me in the back room with like my pants below my ankles. Like more often than not, it's just going back through um, I've had really amazing reactions where I walked through and found security workers just like laughing their ass off on the other end, which is like for me like the best possible case scenario of this. But there's more <laughs> documentation online. Um, so I'll, I'll leave this for now. And, and this, so this brings me to the end, which is like really I think why I'm so fascinated with hacking is, is less about it being playful, less about it being clever, less about it hacking into these systems you're not supposed to be in. Uh, and it's more about this idea of empowerment um, and this idea that very simple things like stainless steel and like zip ties uh, or like, um, yeah, like laser pointers, like all these things that seem so simple and seem so powerless, like when used in these very, in ways that they maybe weren't intended to be used, they can sort of give us a voice in places we weren't meant to have voices. So this is, this is the feeling I like receiving and this is the feeling I like trying to give back in some of my work as well. Um, so I'll leave with one last quote from Raymond uh, further down in his Hacker How-To Guide, which says, the hacker mindset is not confined to this software hacker culture. There are people who apply the hacker attitude to other things like electronics or music. Actually, you can find it at the highest levels of any science or art. Software hackers recognize these kindred spirits elsewhere and may call them hackers too. And some claim that the hacker nature is really independent of the particular medium the hacker works in. And so this is why I, I really think like, Hacking has inspired the art that I'm making, but I think there's things that we can take from this and apply to other things like writing and politics and really any field that sort of involves innovation or creativity. Um, so with that, I'll leave you with a last hack. If anybody wants to contact me, um, you can Google badass motherfucker and it will take you to my blog. Um, so perhaps, this will be the final hack I talk about, but this is one that's... Uh, very low tech also, it involves just a few meta tags and having the word badass motherfucker in every title page of every page on my website. Um, but it's also a social hack as well because clearly I'm not the baddest motherfucker on the planet, yet Google thinks that maybe I am. Um, so uh, thank you so much for coming. We're gonna clear the chairs out and then I believe we will have some snacks and drinks. Um, so please stick around and, and look at the work. I'd like to quickly thank everyone at Axioma uh, Yanez, Marcella, Sonia, Walter, Maita, um, Andrena? Adriana. Adriana, our, our flight attendant here. And Adria Technica, is that how you say? Who donated the use of the chairs, which I've never been able to do and I'm so happy to have access to off of a flight. So please feel free to relax on them. Um, and thanks for all the uh, people who participated in the available online for free workshop the other day. Um, so thank you very much and please stick around and have a drink. Thank you.